So Tom Nagel's death, which is, I think, one of my favorite pieces of philosophy because it's this nice, short, well-written, very impactful and essay, which has had a lot of uh, impact on philosophy, but also reading it, I am just so utterly convinced by everything it says. So it has one of the rare distinctions of being something that I read and just from top to bottom, I'm like, yep, yes, yes, yep, oh wow, yeah, yep, that's all right. So um, it maybe is not the most important piece of philosophy, but it's definitely an interest, it's, it's particularly interesting and distinctive in the sense that um, it's, I think, so on the money about what it's talking about. So let's talk about, let's start talking a little bit about it. Um, what is death? Well, for our purposes, we're going to assume that it's not a transition to a new and different afterlife, but really death, the complete end of the line for you, rather than the beginning of a new phase of life for you in some afterlife, right? Now, maybe that's not true. Maybe there's an afterlife. Um, but let's ask ourselves for in this paper and for our purposes, if there is no afterlife, is death anything to be feared? Is death bad? assuming that it really, death means the real end, not just moving to some other sort of life. So by death for our purposes, we'll be discussing the no afterlife version of death. So what is the no afterlife version of death? Uh, it's something we're all already familiar with. It's just dreamless sleep. Uh, and that we undergo that at some point, all of us undergo that when, when, we're, when we sleep during the night. The only difference is that with death, we never wake up from this. So it is a permanent dreamless sleep. It's permanent unconsciousness. That's what that's what death death is. In a sense, you die every, I mean, in some sense, you could say you die every night, your consciousness is off and it restarts occasionally to dream while you sleep and then again when you awaken. But true death is just the unconsciousness we undergo every night without the restarting. It's the dreamless sleep that we experience at some point, or well, we don't experience it, that we, that happens to us uh, during the night uh, for some period, except for this is one that never ends. Um, but no, I mean, so in one sense, we're very familiar with what death is. In another sense, we are not familiar with death at all. Even if every night we undergo periods of unconscious dreamless sleep, we never experience these periods. In fact, that's precisely what unconsciousness is, not having any conscious experience. Like, dreamless sleep, true unconsciousness, is this thing that we never experience because unconsciousness, dreamless sleep, is the lack of experiences. So dreamless sleep, death, like what death, I, I hesitate to say what death is like, but the, the, the sort of thing death is, is something that happens to us for short spurts during the night, and then death is just that extended out. Although we never experience unconsciousness, it's, it's never we never experience those unconscious periods. We never experience death either. It's it is precisely the lack of consciousness, the lack of experience. So we never know death in the way that we know what it's like to be jealous or to see a particular movie. Right? It is the lack of any sort of experience. So being dead like dreamless sleep isn't like anything. It's the lack of being there to have an experience. It's not anything we can ever, in one sense, be familiar with because it's precisely something we can't experience since it's the lack of experience, conscious experience. Um, it's a quote from Nagel. Uh, Clearly, if death is an evil at all, it cannot be because of its positive features, but only because of what it deprives us of. So why is this idea, I mean, what he's saying here is death is a deprivation. It's bad because of what it involves us lacking. Death itself is not an experience. It's not a state we're in. It's not painful. It's not like anything. So if that is a bad state to be in, to be dead, to lack consciousness, to have a permanent dreamless sleep, it's not bad because of what it's like it's bad of what it deprives us of. I mean, in particular, we're gonna talk about life. So we need to say why 
life is so good and why life benefits us and why being a lot like what good things uh, we can secure for ourselves when we're alive and then death is bad not because of what death is like because death is not like anything but because of what death means that we're going to lack we're going to lack all of the goods that life contains dying is different we have to really be clear to distinguish dying from death dying can be painful dying is like something i fear i mean personally i don't fear death but i do fear dying and since we all have to go through the process of dying where you're bleeding out or painfully slowly coming to an end that seems like a very unpleasant experience um which uh I think it can make sense to fear in the same sense that I fear being stabbed or it can be bad for me in the same sense that any sort of suffering can be bad for me because dying is a very unpleasant thing. Death on the other hand is not like anything like, but death is not painful or unpleasant. Again it isn't like anything. It's the permanent ending of our having any experiences ever again. So the badness of death can't be like the badness of pain or that death is painful. The badness of death must be due to a deprivation of something good. Death is the state that if we're in it deprives us of some other good stuff we could have had had we been in the other state presumably alive or being alive. Again, some quotes from Nagel. It's often said that those who object to death have made the mistake of trying to imagine what it's like to be dead. That's like this terrible thing to be dead, and I'm scared of being in that state. That makes no sense, right? Death is not like anything. Uh, but if death is an evil, it is the loss of life, this good thing life, or the good things that we can obtain when we're alive, rather than the state of being dead or non-existent or unconscious that is objectionable. So the upshot is, if we are to make sense of the view that to die is bad, it must be on the ground that life is a good and death is the corresponding deprivation or loss of life. Bad, not because of any positive features, but because of the desirability of what it removes. In the paper, Nagel's going to go on to discuss a couple difficulties that might be raised to this idea of death being a deprivation. Uh, number one, you might complain that there can be no evil which does not depend upon someone minding that evil, that deprivation. So uh, we're not, we don't exist when we're dead. We don't have preferences when we're dead. We don't find the state of death unpleasant and wish we were not in it. So you might complain that, well, how can death be bad for me? Because when I'm in that state, it's not like it's a state I want to get out of or I have a problem with being in, when I'm dead, I don't have any preferences. Uh, I think I'll, well, I'll say more about that in a little bit, but, but I think that a lot of that's going to depend on whether you think that, um, you know, even if I don't know that some wrong or something bad has happened to me, whether that's still bad for me, or if I have to know about it, for it to be bad for me, right? So if a significant other cheats on you, but you never find out, some might argue that you've never been harmed, you've not been wronged, nothing bad has happened to you. Um, the other way to think about it is, well, no, you've been wronged, even if you don't find, it doesn't require you to, to notice or find out or experience the suffering of knowing for it to have been a wrong and to make and to be bad for you. It can st if, if your life's work that you were about to publish when you die gets destroyed, if all of your children who you thought were about to be successful get killed the minute you die, if it turns out that your significant other had been cheating on you and hated you your entire marriage but covered it up, you know, if you die thinking that you've succeeded at your life's work, that your children are successful and that your loved, mar loveful, loving marriage was like a loving mutual marriage, and all of that was a lie, but then, I mean, have you had a good life or a bad life? If you, th this objection is the claim, is somebody who might want to say, you've had a good life because you didn't find out. You can only be harmed by things you know about and have a problem with, right? Because you're, you're like, I don't want to suffer or I don't like that this happened. Or um, if that's the case, then there is this issue about how you can explain 
death being bad since uh, you're not there to object to it. On the other hand, if you think that um, you can be harmed and wronged and your life can be made worse by things you don't know about, by your life's work being destroyed the minute you die, by your children being killed and slaughtered the minute you die, your significant other always hating you and lying to you and your friends being the same way your whole life, but you never find it. If all of that means that you led a bad life, even though you didn't find out about it, then it's easier to see how death, even though you're not there to experience it, is still bad for you. Um, here, here's another objection that people have, this goes back to, uh, I believe, Epicurus. This is a line of argument that people have raised against the idea of death being bad. Who is the subject of this bad thing, death? And when is death bad for that person? Uh, you're not there. I mean, a headache is bad for me when I'm experiencing it. Like we can talk about, well, here's this bad thing that happened to Fife, and it happened to Fife on this day, and that's when he had to undergo this bad thing. But I'm not there after I'm dead, in dead, like true death. And so I'm not there to be subject to death and to be having this bad thing happen to me. And it's hard to, is death bad for me before I die? Is it bad? Like, when, when does this bad thing happen to me? Because I'm not there after death. So it can't be bad for me when I'm dead because there's nothing good or bad for me when I'm dead, right? That's, there's, there's no me there. So, I mean, here's a quote from Nagel. So long as a person exists, he has not yet died. And once he has died, he no longer exists. So there seems to be no time when death, if it is a misfortune, can be ascribed to this unfortunate subject. Uh, the Epicurus has this quote, I, I, I'm going to butcher it, it's something like, you know, when death is here, I am not. When I am here, death is not. So how can I have a problem with death? Uh, another difficulty that Nagel is going to discuss in the paper is how can it be bad for our lives to end, but not bad that our lives didn't begin earlier? So Nagel's just pointing out that we really regret the fact that our lives didn't extend longer, that we didn't live an immortal life, that we couldn't have lived longer, and that we're missing out on all the things that in the future that by our by dying we're not going to be able to experience or be alive or be around to have. But we don't seem to have a similar worry or fear or complaint about the fact that we missed out on all this stuff before we were born, right? We we had, you know, to, to the extent that like pre-birth is like also a dreamless sleep, an unconsciousness, an, a, you know, a period where we didn't exist and don't have any sort of experiences. And then we come into existence for a period of time with lots of conscious experiences. And we live a life and then it ends. And then that same thing happens again, Uncon you know, unconscious, dreamless sleep where we're not there and we don't experience anything. So why is the part after our lives something we fear and think is really bad for us and it's really regrettable? that it happened to us and that we couldn't have lived longer, but we don't have that similar attitude towards before we were born and wishing we, and thinking it's this equally terrible thing that we weren't born earlier and that we missed out on all this uh, life we could have lived had we been born earlier. Uh, another way to put it is if we die a year early, we find that really regrettable and terrible, but we don't find it terrible that we weren't born a year earlier, right? That we were deprived of being, of, of missing out on the experiences before we were born. Um, I'm not gonna talk about all the difficulties that Nagel talks about. In fact, I'm not gonna talk about really much of anything else in Nagel's paper. The, the reason is from experience of teaching, I know that if I provide a really comprehensive lecture that covers everything in the paper, then people won't be inclined to read the paper and so I don't want to provide a substitute for the paper because the paper is it's not that long and it is beautifully written and it is powerfully written and I think it's definitely worth your time uh, the only objection I, I guess I kind of want to talk about a little bit because I, I think that I mean I feel like often students think that the second problem is the more interesting one the Epicurean one about how there's no one who exists after you're dead to be subject to death and be subject to this bad thing evil of death so it can't be bad but i find this first objection the, the more interesting one to talk about it, it definitely has connections to our conversation about nozick's experience machine if you would plug into the experience machine it's because you think what is good or bad for you is what's going on in your head that you experience pleasure or you think that your desires are satisfied and that you feel successful and that you live this 
you know, in your head, you think that it's real, you know, you have all of the experiences of a successful life and that's all that matters and that's what's good and bad for you. It seems like death probably can't be bad if that's the case, right? Because when you're dead, you're not gonna feel unhappy about being dead. You're not gonna feel anything, that's what death is. On the other hand, if you think that it's, you know, you wouldn't plug into the experience machine and you think that, oh no, actually, you know, if my significant other hated me and was cheating on me, that's bad for me even if I don't find out. It's bad for me it, it, not because of I'd have this experience of being sad and feeling betrayed, but because I'm actually betrayed and because of I've actually been wronged and that somebody has you know, treated my will with you know, disrespect and has treated me like somebody who, you know, in a way that doesn't respect uh, my freedom to decide you know, what relationships I will get into or get out of because they're lying to me and covering things up and and, it, and even on maybe virtue ethical terms that that I, I've lived a life that has the appearance to me of being successful and loved and happy and with loved ones and people who love me and in real true relationships with true friends but actually none of that's the case like the virtue ethicist is going to say that's a terrible life I'm so sorry for you I mean like it's better than maybe a life of being tortured and suffering but it's pretty bad to like live a completely fictional life where actually you've been completely unsuccessful. Uh, I, 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 so it, it connects up to that because if you think that what matters, or at least maybe what you value, is real life and not plugging into the experience machine and like really not being, you know, having a loved one who really loves you and actually, you know, not just having the illusion in your head of being happy and satisfied because of your misperceptions because of an illusion, but actually um, having a life with true loved ones where you're actually helping people, where you actually have true relationships, where you're actually able to do things. I mean, if you care about you know reality uh, in the way that leads you to not plug into the experience machine, I think that it's very easy for you to make sense of death being a bad. Uh, it's bad even though you never have to experience death because death is not an experience. Death is the lack of experiences. It's not like, but but things don't have to be experienced to be bad for you if you're the sort of person who doesn't plug into the experience machine. If you're the sort of person who does plug into the experience machine, then for something to be bad for you, you have to experience it and death isn't something you experience. So you could probably make a pretty quick argument to death not being bad. I, I, I tend to think that not only would I not plug into the experience machine, uh, I also think that maybe, or I also think that um, it's it's a it's a mistake to not to plug in. I think that it's wrong to think of value working that way, and that actually people who would plug in are wrong. Not that Nozick's argument shows that, right? Nozick's experience machine is just supposed to show us whether we value you know, just the experiences in our head, or if we value real life, depending on whether we would plug in or not. But uh, I think, you know, a further argument could be provided, which, um, which would have to show, and I think could show that that not plugging in is the right thing to do. And if not plugging in is the right thing to do, then it then you could you could make a pretty quick argument to death being bad. Um, just a personal story real quick, because I find this really funny. Um, I teach uh, 11 year olds, middle schoolers uh, philosophy at John Hopkins Center for Talented Youth uh, in the summers. And I had one class where I taught a day on death. Um, and uh, we talked, you know, we talked about Nagel, we did a lot of the similar discussions that we're having here. Um, and I had a I had this little 11 year old boy who the next day, or maybe the, a, a day or two later, mentions in class that he dreamt that he committed suicide the night before. And of course, as a teaching 11 year olds, I, I needed to check on check in with this kid who was talking about dreaming about committing suicide. So I pull him out of class at some point when when there's the opportunity and I talk to him about it. And he says, Oh, no, 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 you misunderstand. I didn't commit suicide in my dream. I just died. We were in class we were doing a play and then all the oxygen went out of the room and I suffocated and died. And I'm like, I don't, it's a little better, but like, I'm still a little afraid as to why my students dreaming about dying. And he says, the funny thing is, so the oxygen goes out of the room, I suffocate. And at like, right when I die, I wake up 
you know, in a panic because like in the dream I died. And he said, I normally that would have been a nightmare. I woke up and I died and, and, and I would have been normally scared. But you know what? I don't I, I don't fear death anymore. I don't think death is a bad thing. So I just went right back to sleep and wasn't bothered by it. And I'm like, that's really cool that this class has had that effect on you. He really bought um, this Lucretius argument that, you know, or Epicurus argument that if, if I, when I die, I, I'm not there to experience it. So it can't be bad for me. He like, and so he decided that, yeah, no, I, I'm convinced that death isn't bad. So I'm really like happy that this 11 year old kid had that like experience of no longer fearing death. I'm a little worried that maybe he'll go, he'll go do, do some dumb things now that he doesn't fear death uh, later in life. So I don't know if it was entirely a good effect that this philosophy class had had on that 11 year old, but it was, it was, it was interesting to, to, to have this material that you guys are uh, reading this week, in particular, the Nagel death article having that effect on, uh, on that 11 year old.